They are symbolized by a crest depicting a wide expanse of green fields stretching out into the distance for their agrarian culture and strong work ethic, a rising sun and a setting moon for the transition of the region from Islam to Christianity, a fortress for the war which made these lands available to them, whose six towers represent the six major regions settled by these people, above the river which brought them to their homeland and which gave them their name. Watching over it all, the eagle of the German imperial crest for the emperor's responsibility to them and for their German roots. Who are these people? And what happened to them? The Dona Schwaben once comprised the largest group of ethnic Germans in southeastern Europe, numbering approximately 1.5 million before World War II. However, their origins lie far earlier than that. In the early 18th century, after the Habsburg Empire defeated the Ottoman Turks, many Germans were commanded by Kaiser Franz Josef to settle the lands left barren by the war. They followed the Danube River to their new home. So, Kaiser Franz Josef, if you know what I'm talking about, he said to some people, to whoever wanted it, go over there. They, I gave everybody so much land, and uh, you can settle down there. So uh, a lot of them did because, and they left. It was called. It was called. The Ulmer Schachtel, which they, 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 they put together wooden, a wooden, like a wooden box, and they would, so many people would fit in there and went, and the Daniel till they landed wherever they wanted to. In 1723, many German settlers began in earnest to settle the Hungarian basin. They came from homelands and regions throughout modern day Germany, particularly from the city of Ulm, for which their boats were named. These settlers became known as Danube Swabians, or Donoschwaben. As they began to settle the land along the Danube, the Donoschwaben found that the land was harsh and difficult to farm, but they were determined and persevered. But that was very bad land. It was it was uh, not uh, uh, it was like a like a jungle, so to speak, and those people had absolutely nothing to work with. They made all their stuff, whatever they found. There is not another nation, another, another uh, uh, country as hard working people as the Daniel Schwaben. Like the saying was, you can take everything away today from the Daniel Schwab, from the Donald Schwabe. Tomorrow he has it back because they were very, very ambitious. The Donald Schwaben prospered despite the early challenges developing a unique culture combining their German heritage with that of others who settled that region. They have maintained many of their traditions for hundreds of years. Their sense of community was strong, and each village enjoyed celebrating festivals each year, filled with music, dancing, and delicious food. The biggest festival of the year was Kirvai Fest. Kirvai, or Kirvai Fest, Festival of the Consecration of the Church, was a big celebration on the last Sunday in October. It was the biggest thing aside from weddings. The week before, in preparation for the event, the house was cleaned and freshly painted, inside and out. Besides that, all the food preparations had to be done for the event. It was called Crazy Week. On Saturday night, the celebration got started by shooting blanks and ringing bells. Each of the pubs would plant a Kirvai bomb outside their establishment. This was a little tree decorated with colorful ribbons and bottles. Then the pub owner would dig up the buried Kirvai from last year. This was usually a wine bottle hidden under a loose board in the pub. After this was consumed or poured out, depending on how well the wine kept, the dancing began. On Sunday morning, everybody in town and tourists would go to church. The celebration really got underway after lunch. Vendors brought in their wares of candies and ice cream for the kids. The children could also ride a carousel at times. The men bowled or just sat around and sipped wine in the company of their wives. The young folks would dance, of course, till three in the morning. 
On Monday afternoon, the celebration continued with dancing, and at the end of the evening, newly filled bottles got buried again until next year. As years went by, other ethnic groups settled the land along the Danube where the Donaschwaben had first settled, and for many years, the many groups lived in peace and friendship, sharing aspects both of culture and language. In the house, we spoke German. On the street, we spoke Serbian. We lived in a Serbian village, right? However, ethnic tensions rose following World War I. The Balkan states were partitioned into a number of smaller states. This was especially hard for the Donaschwaben. The borders were drawn such that this ethnic group, although large, did not constitute a majority in any of the new countries. These new borders caused tension to rise between the Donaschwaben, other ethnic Germans, and other groups living in the newly created countries. In the case of Poland, for instance, the violations of the Minorities Treaty of 28 July 1919 are documented in several thousand petitions which were submitted to the League of Nations in the years 1919 to 1934. There were two areas of frequent conflict between the German minorities and Polish authorities, one being the question of obtaining Polish citizenship, and the other the widespread confiscation of German farms and eviction of the German owners through discriminatory Polish legislation. A typical eviction case came before the Permanent Court of Justice in The Hague, which on 10 September 1923 delivered an advisory opinion on the merits. The court unanimously held, quote, that the measures complained of were a virtual annulment of legal rights possessed by the farmers under their contracts, and being directed, in fact, against a minority and subjecting it to discriminating and injurious treatment to which other citizens holding contracts of sale or lease were not subject, were a breach of Poland's obligations under the Minorities Treaty. This sort of case frequently reappeared in court and in other petitions submitted to the League of Nations through the year 1934, when the Polish government finally repudiated the League's minority system. Much of this discrimination and enmity came ostensibly as the result of disloyalty on the part of those ethnic minorities who were now within the borders of new host countries. Still, there is little evidence that such widespread disloyalty actually existed. The Donaschwaben had been living in these regions for hundreds of years at this point and were well entrenched in local culture. The Ingelman family lived in the village of Newdorf in Yugoslavia, now called Bakonovo Selo, in modern-day Serbia. Between the two wars, things got no better for our Donaschwaben people. The enmity which the Croats and Serbs had for each other took a back seat to the anti-German hate campaign that surfaced in the 20s and 30s. The writing was on the wall. Taxes for our people were doubled in every German community, in contrast to those of the Slavs and Hungarians. Complaining at the county seat or at the capital Belgrade got our disgruntled citizens nowhere. Instead, it was looked upon as an affront to the state and brought about warnings and reprimands. Our lone representative at the state level was scoffed at when he brought up these complaints from our people. So we had to endure. And we still prospered. Security for our people slackened greatly in comparison to pre-World War I levels because thievery by the Slavs increased dramatically as these aforementioned now raided our countryside, especially during harvest time. Complaints about the thefts of fruits, grapes, corn, or wheat from individuals' fields and orchards fell on deaf ears, even when the individuals or gangs were caught. Our policemen would arrest the thieves, but the central authorities in the big city, consisting of all Slavs, would set them free without punishment or remuneration for the robbed farmers. These rising tensions would soon erupt into a burst of hate for the Donaschwaben and other ethnic Germans, as the Second World War led to an explosion of widespread anti-German sentiment. In early 1945, the Allies met at Yalta for a preliminary conference to determine what should be done with the millions of persons displaced by World War II. At this conference, many important decisions were made that would impact the Donaschwaben's fate. The most important was condoning certain governments' choices to expel ethnic Germans who had lived within their countries and had for generations. In the early spring months of 1945, as the war approached its conclusion, millions of German civilians from Pomerania, Silesia, and East Prussia filled the roads to the west in their desperate flight from the fury of the conquering Soviet army. Millions, however, had remained behind, and it was at this time that the actual expulsions got underway, beginning as soon as Polish authorities moved into the occupied German provinces. Who authorized these expulsions? 
Did the Allied decisions at Yalta provide legal justification for the physical removal of Germans from territories subject to belligerent occupation? The fact is that these early expulsions were carried out with the encouragement of the Soviet government, but without the knowledge or authorization of the Western Allies. Of course, the leaders of Great Britain and the United States had already endorsed the principle of population transfers as applied to the Germans, and in this sense they do not escape a share of the responsibility for the excesses that accompanied the actual implementation of the principle. Yet, their endorsement had been a limited one, with the governments of Poland and later Czechoslovakia chose to interpret as a green light for indiscriminate expulsions. By the summer of 1945, the forces led by the German Nazis had been defeated, but the anti-German sentiment was still running high. In July 1945, the victorious Allies met for the Potsdam Conference. It was there that they signed the Potsdam Agreement, authorizing the orderly and humane expulsion of millions of ethnic Germans from their homes outside of Germany. This decision was based solely on the German ancestry of these people, despite the fact that they had not lived in Germany for generations. Although the Potsdam Agreement specified that the expulsion of the Dona Schwaben be orderly and humane, and although there was a lack of strong justification for the expulsion, the ethnic cleansing of the Dona Schwaben in the 1940s was a brutal one. It was undertaken by a number of groups, most notably Tito's partisans. Tito whose given name was Josip Braz, became the Secretary General of the Communist Party of Yugoslavia in 1937. In the summer of 1941, his forces began attacking the German occupying forces in Yugoslavia and seized control of the country. Before World War II, well over 18 million Germans lived in what was generally referred to as Eastern Europe during the Cold War. That is, in East Prussia, Pomerania, the eastern part of Brandenburg, Silesia, the free city of Danzig, as well as in territories outside the then German Reich, in Czechoslovakia, notably in the Sudetenland, in the Baltic states, in interwar Poland, Hungary, Romania, Yugoslavia, and in parts of the Soviet Union. Beginning in the late summer months of 1944, of those who had survived the war up until then, more than 14 million were expelled between the end of 1944 and 1948, about 2 million were killed or died of starvation or suicide. And even though no reliable figures exist, there is a basic consensus that the overall number of those who perished was in the neighborhood of two million. The numbers given refer to all ethnic Germans living in these regions, not just the Dona Schwaben. The reasons for the ethnic cleansing were many. However, despite the fact that the Dona Schwaben and other German-speaking ethnic groups in the area had nothing to do with the Nazis and had not lived in Germany for generations, the most common justification given is that the expulsion was an act of revenge against the Germans due to the atrocities of the Nazis. For Tito and his partisans, the expulsion also served to reinforce their power, and since it also involved the seizure of lands vacated by the expellees, it provided them with the means to establish the system of government-owned land central to establishing a communist system. Piece by piece, the partisans took over Yugoslavia and the Dona Schwaben villages therein. Those ethnic Germans who were unable to flee before the partisans arrived in their villages could expect one of three fates. They would be transported to camps in Yugoslavia, sent by train to serve as slave laborers in Russia, or else they would die or be executed en route to those locations. Anna Koenig was eight years old and living in a small village in Yugoslavia the same village in which her family had been living for almost 200 years when she and her family were forced to flee. We had to leave our homeland, our hometown, because the partisan, the communism, after the war stopped, we Germans that were still there, they wanted to kill us. We had to leave. We had to leave. Uh, and so we went on horse and buggy my aunt with three children, with two children, my mom with four children, and my grandmother and my aunt and my mom on one wagon, whatever we could put, put on, a covered wagon, and went, uh, left. So did everybody else. Whoever didn't have horses in a buggy, they were shipped by train. And they had to, they went uh, uh, to East, what, what was used to be East Germany, that they, they uh, took them over there, and we traveled through Hungary and into Austria. And the Austrian people had to take us in because 
we did, we were homeless, okay? So they took us in and uh, at, at a former, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, nine months into that where we were living there, the Russians came by and said to us, go back home, everything is okay back home. And that's all what my grandmother want, wanted to hear. Everything is fine. So they took ox in a, a wagon, a flat wagon, put us on there, and we traveled back home from Austria into to Yugoslavia. So as we came to the border of Austria and Yugoslavia, they took everything away but what we had on and put us in concentration camp for three and a half years. And then uh, we went from one camp to the other. We were chased out. We didn't have no, no choice. So uh, the Russians came and they, you know, they wanted everybody that was German out of Yugoslavia. Because most of the people, I mean, a lot of the people were Croatian. And they were allowed to stay. But the Germans all had to leave, uh, move, you know, just leave. The whole families, you couldn't take nothing along or... He could a little bit, but not very much. You, you Anna Stagel was five years old when she and her family fled. Like yeah, yeah, we went to Hamburg, and there we had to stay in the a thing. And from there, we were went to Schlesien again. They, they pushed us. Nobody wanted us, you know. So we were pushed kind of from one end to another. And so the Donnerschwamm people, the Germans didn't want anything to do with them. Even though they were German people, right. they, they, they they looked at them as yeah. like gypsies, and we don't want yeah. they, you know they yeah. they didn't they had enough problems on their own, but they're with, and they didn't really want to have anything to do it. So even now, there's still repercussions because of that that they were that they never you know that they didn't want anything to do with them. That's where we were in Germany, in Saxony, and I remember that real well. So, and my dad, uh, my dad wasn't with us. He was uh, he was working for the railroads. And uh, he came back and he said that, they said that we can go back home. And there were so many of the families that were by us around there that uh, they did go home and they gave us a train, you know, each a, a thing to go home. And my dad said, no, 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 we're going to stay. No, I think my mom was on it. said, no, no, we're going to stay here. I don't think that's a good place to time to go home now. And we stayed, and all those people that left in that train, they got killed. They just well, you heard Mrs. even Mrs. Uh, Koenig's situation, where she went back, her parents, her family went back, and they got thrown in, in, in yeah. the camps. Three months old when my folks had to flee, a few days before, because uh, they knew some, well, the German army was in there, in Hungary already, and they told the people, and it was a small town, they told the people that the Russians were coming. Basically, we were fleeing from the Russians. And uh, they said they would be there in a matter of days, and that's when my mom and family, my grandfather, he died in the war. He was missing in action, so we never knew what happened there. And they f fled then uh, with just a few belongings, and then they got separated, family members got separated on the way, but then they reunited, so, uh, and they settled in Bavaria then on a farm. A farmer took us in. On November 24th, 1944, Tito's government, whom the Allies had put in charge, declared the Germans enemies of the people and stripped us all of our civic rights, which included ownership of personal property. This was the beginning of the end for the German people in Yugoslavia. On December 8, 1944, my grandfather, Opa, and close to 400 other men were ordered to pack up and report to a work camp. As they assembled in the square, guards patrolled them. If one of the guards saw a nice pair of shoes or a jacket that he liked, the owner had to give it to the guard. If anyone refused, they simply shot him right then and there and took the article. When all were accounted for, the men marched out of the village. Somebody got really brave and rang the church bells as the first group of people left our village. They did not know that they were leaving their homes forever, and some of them would never see their families again. The men, 
who were between the ages of 15 and 60 years old were told that they were going to a work camp, which was about 12 miles away. Later we found out that when they got to the next town, a doctor checked them over to see if they were able to work. Those who were considered unable to work by the doctor were taken into the woods and shot. No graves were dug. The rest of the group went on to another town called Maramarak, where they worked in the woods, chopping and hauling firewood. When there was no more work in the woods, the men were moved to a town called Kuvin. In the spring of 1945, this camp was dissolved, and some of the men were transferred to a town called Wershitz. Others went to Shrem, which was another region in Yugoslavia. My grandfather and a few others went to a town called Mitrovic. The unluckiest ones were those who were shipped to Russia to their labor camp. Mr. Grauer, a baker by trade from Fansfeld, went with Opa to Mitrovitz. He told us later that Opa was put in charge of some of the men. When things came up Missy, Opa was supposed to find the thief and hand him over. When Opa did not turn anybody in, he was put in isolation and never returned to camp. He died in isolation on December 3rd, 1946, at the age of 60. A number of camps were formed throughout Yugoslavia, many built simply by fencing in Donishwaban villages with barbed wire and erecting guard towers. And although there was some variation in occupants and purpose, the conditions of overcrowding, insufficient food, and cruelty were constant throughout. Everybody has a different uh, uh, situation, but my situation was that, that, uh, so... We, we came from one to the other. Sometimes we had to walk. Sometimes they put us on the train and, uh, uh, and, and went uh, and were there for uh, uh, seven, eight months and then again someplace else. Uh, when, when the partisans came in, I was too young to know what, what was going on. And the first camp we were in was Yarek. And I remember nothing because I was too young, didn't know anything. And uh, the furthest back experience was my, in the third camp. Second camp was vague. So uh, the last camp that we were in, a lot of people died. And we were very lucky that none of my family died. Uh, we were the first, we were all in barracks on, on wooden floor, uh, wooden bump beds. Just the cover, nothing else. Just the plain wood, and we were full of lies. We were we were undernourished. We didn't get much food in the mornings. We might have gotten lukewarm water. And uh, what they tried to do not kill us by gun, but kill us kill us by starvation. And a lot of people got sick, were very ill, very ill. So was I. I had I had every sickness you can imagine. I had. Typhus, I had cholera, I had everything that a person gets when you don't have nourishment. Some of the Donishwaban captured by the partisans faced another fate. Instead of being taken to camps within Yugoslavia, some ethnic Germans were shipped to Russia as slave labor. According to the Danube Swabian Association of the USA, in 1944, Stalin demanded ethnic German slave laborers from the governments of Hungary and Romania. The DSA cites the number of Donishwaban sent to work in mines and other industrial regions of Russia at 12,000, 8,000 women and 4,000 men. In his book, Frank Engelman tells the story of his aunt, Johanna, who was one of those sent to Russia. She was luckier than most. Most of the men from our village had been taken by the partisans at Christmas in 1944, but the women did not have long to wait for their ordeal. On December 28th came an announcement from the new community commander, a partisan lackey, directing the women to assemble in the city hall for a two-week-long work detail. This caused a big outcry, especially among the mothers with little children, but to no avail. Altogether, there were 72 women and girls ages 18 to 30 and three underage teens. They were forced to march over 100 kilometers to a village named Kula, which served as a collection point for German women from other villages in the state of Bachka. Thousands were ripped from their homes, families, and even from the arms of their crying children. Those who were found to be sick, pregnant, or underage were lucky. They were sent back. 
On January 1st, 1945, the whole lot were stuffed into railroad cattle cars, which were without toilets or even straw to lie down on. All the passengers had assumed that it would only be a one-day trip. However, the train kept going through Hungary and Romania towards Russia. After ten days in the freezing, stinking wagons, they had to change trains since the Russian track system was not compatible with the Austro-Hungarian one. There were many tears shed for the loved ones left behind, and fear was on every woman's face, fear of the uncertainty that lay before them. Auntie had to leave her five-year-old son behind and worried about her husband, whose whereabouts were unknown. She clung to the hope of seeing her son again because Oma, her mother-in-law, had promised to look after the boy. Finally, on January 20th, they arrived at the railroad depot Toshkova, a mining complex. There, all the prisoners were searched again so no contraband would be brought in. Names were read off the list, and each civilian was checked off, followed by endless questions and endless standing at attention. The inquiries about party affiliation and military service of relatives were intended to expose fervor for the German cause, but with little result since most of our people were simple farmers who wanted no part in the war. Auntie told the interrogator that her husband and his brother, my father, had been made prisoners of war by the Germans after the takeover because both of them had been drafted into the Yugoslav army just before 1940. What Auntie neglected to tell them, though, was that her brother, who was only 15, had been kidnapped by the German army during the retreat and pressed into service. Those, however, who admitted having relatives that served in the German armed forces were separated from the rest and put in a special barrack. They were dealt with much harsher. All prisoners had been delivered as presents to Stalin for his help in aiding the Yugoslavs during the war. The new inmates had to sit around at first, awaiting their daily interrogations, while the veterans toiled away in the mines. Johanna was both very smart and very lucky. She managed to convince the interrogator that she had been a cook for a royal house, even though she had not been, and was thus able to gain an important position. With her extensive training as she grew up, Auntie was able to whip up a tasty soup out of nothing. She passed muster and was then named the commandant's private cook. Joanna was able to use her skills with cooking and language, as well as her cleverness to gain better conditions for her fellow Donishwabans, and to eventually engineer her own escape. However, most of the others sent to Russia were not so lucky. With such widespread hardship and suffering, it seems strange that no one should know about it. That after all this time, and everything that happened, the general public remains ignorant of its very existence. It seems unlikely that these expulsions should remain out of common knowledge merely by accident. Indeed, this does not seem to have been the case. Rather, the ignorance is the result of the combined efforts of many who hoped to forget or escape the truth. Frank Engelman's grandfather was put on burial duty in one of the camps, and he detailed one way in which the mass executions were covered up. Opa explained the burial methods to me as follows. It was real slave work to excavate the ditches, especially when the ground was frozen. He and the other undernourished laborers had to excavate holes that measured about 12 feet wide, 30 to 50 feet long, and 6 to 9 feet deep, depending a lot on the consistency of the substrata. As soon as one cavernous hole had been completed, the workers moved to a new site, adjoining the completed one. The dead were laid out in double rows, so that their heads touched and their feet extended away from the center. Up to 100 bodies were accommodated in each ditch, sometimes more. On top of the first layer of bodies came a layer of lime, then a foot of dirt, followed by another row of deceased, laid out identically as the first layer. Opa commented to us that the digging could continue ad infinitum, due to the fact that nothing lay on this flat plain between the graves and Hungary many miles away. Some months later, after the mounds of dirt had settled over the top of the graves and lay even with the surrounding earth, Opa was ordered to plow over the sacred ground and plant winter wheat in the fall and winter and corn in the spring so there would be no trace of the murderous deeds perpetrated on our people. There were no prayers said by a priest. 
no blessing of the bodies or of the ground that swallowed them. The corpses became just inanimate objects to be hidden from the eyes of the living. And Opa swore that those souls were doomed to roam the earth because their final resting places had not been blessed, but that their cries would reach heaven with pleas for justice. Furthermore, additional measures were taken to conceal the partisans' campaign against the ethnic Germans of Yugoslavia. Cameras were always the first thing confiscated when our villages were attacked and taken over, so there would be no photographic evidence of the crimes against our people. If there is any evidence in that respect, it is well hidden or destroyed. Through the systematic prevention of evidence, along with the concealing of the victims' very graves, the partisans succeeded in keeping this ethnic cleansing out of the public eye of the world. There was no pictures taken, there's absolutely nothing showing what we went through. We can imagine the walls, the barbed wire, the guard towers, but without photographs to etch these barriers in our minds, everything that happened doesn't feel quite real. This era in Europe is already saturated with such atrocity and hate that the invisible Donoshwaben story can be missed amid the deluge of evidence and photographs from the Holocaust. Indeed, little or no physical evidence of the Donoshwaben camps has survived. And so the photos shown here come not from these camps, but from Dachau one of the largest and worst camps of the Holocaust, which is well-preserved and filled with the images of its dark past. And yet, despite all this, there actually exists concerning evidence that certain governments knew what was happening, not after the fact, but as the expulsions were taking place. Of course, the governments of Stalin and of the Balkan states carrying out the expulsions knew, but it seemed plausible, if not likely, that several Allied governments knew as well. Worse, they may have condoned some of what took place, beyond the directive given at the Potsdam Conference for an orderly and humane population transfer. One example of this was a high-ranking Britain in 1947. Robin Hankey, the Foreign Office Poland Specialist and one-time diplomat of the Warsaw Embassy was one of a number of influential Britons to receive an unsolicited letter in the summer of 1947 from his friend and former Foreign Office colleague Michael Vivian. Enclosed with the letter was a report written by a 26-year-old woman who had arrived in Germany six months previously after spending more than 18 months at the Pachelis internment camp in Poland. <clears throat> the account carried the ring of truth and was consistent with many other such testimonies the Western allies had been receiving about Pachelis and similar establishments. In his response to Vivian, Hanke did not contest the accuracy of anything he had been told, but neither did he think it especially worthy of notice. I agree that the conditions you describe are horrifying. I should have been much more deeply moved if I had not myself been to the extermination camps at Maidenek and Auschwitz satisfied myself of the evidence available that the Poles are telling the truth when they allege that about six million Jews and Poles were exterminated like flies by the Germans. Having seen myself 800,000 pairs of shoes of people who had been murdered, including the shoes of tiny children of two and three, I cannot work up much sympathy for the poor Germans, much as I condemn the way that they were treated. In the immediate post-war era, such a response was typical. What is remarkable is that in the more than 60 years that have passed since the expulsion of the ethnic Germans concluded, it largely remains so. In both popular and scholarly treatments of the episode in European history, the Holocaust has generally provided the context for discussions of the expulsion, or even for deciding, as in Hanke's case, whether it ought to be discussed at all. Did you ever try to escape? Uh, we did a few times because a lot of people did. And uh, we tried twice and it didn't work. 
And so my mother said, now we came that far being alive. Now we're not going to let him shoot us. So we waited out till we had the right papers to leave Yugoslavia and go to see my father. And as people died off, more, more were brought in from outside, from other camps that they had, had retaken. Because quite a few people escaped and went back to their home and then they were caught again and brought back. And uh, we escaped from Krakowa and we were caught and brought back and the third camp was Kushivo. It was smaller, it was a camp just for the hard cases for people like us who knew how to, how to abscond, I guess. And uh, Grandma would sneak out at night. She was fluent in Hungarian and she'd pick out the Hungarian farms around the, around the camp and they were always generous to us and gave us things. And then she'd sneak back in and get beat up sometimes for bringing stuff in. But she was able to get word out to our relatives in America. And they sent stuff to that Hungarian farm. And we got money and other things. And eventually we were able to bribe the head honcho to let us out. And he furnished a troop of guards that took us to the Hungarian border, which wasn't far away. And she gave him the money and they didn't shoot us or anything, they just let us go. So uh, it took a few more months and then uh, Truman, President Truman was president at that time. And he got wind of it. And some of our people from Austria already came over here to this country. And he got wind of it and put pressure on Tito. Marshal Tito was the, was the president of Yugoslavia. He put pressure on to release everybody. And that's how we got back home to our hometown. And then we tried to find where my father was. My father was in a war and he was captured by the Americans and he was in Bavaria. So we united with my father in 1950. And so uh, this is this is how that's how that's yeah. after the war. Yeah. yeah, I think it was after the war. And they said that yeah. we uh, we could go home, you know, back home to our houses. And uh, you know, we didn't. We were lucky. So from there, I think I don't know if it was. Uh, I think it was Middle East. Right? That's the lower part of the Austria. Then it became kind of a normal life for yeah. You, you, you. Yeah. Well, we were there. Well, my. Brother and sister, Horst and Helga, were born there, and that was in 47. In 1948, okay, my grandmother, my dad's mom, she was the one that came over here first. And we wanted to go with her, and they closed it up like they did uh, here now, you know, when they said they no more no yeah. more people coming in. Well, that's what they did from 48 to 50. Nobody, no German people were allowed to come over here. So, but then they let us in 50, so that's when we came here. Otherwise we would have come earlier. Probably, I don't know. So. My mom and dad worked on the farm and there really was no future there. I mean, we made a living and that was it. We could have never had our own house or anything. And my aunt, she had relatives over here. So my aunt and uncle and their family, they immigrated to over here. And then five years later, we immigrated. We couldn't do it earlier because my grandma, she was uh, a little bit older and they didn't, but then eventually they let her come too and we weren't gonna leave her behind. Actually, my family, uh, when we uh, uh, came out, my mom and my, uh, my three brothers, uh, uh, we also wanted to go because my, my father's uh, uh, two sisters, three sisters, and a brother were already here. One was in Canada, uh, a, a sister and a brother in California, and one uh, sister of my dad's was here in Akron. And he also wanted to uh, to leave, uh, uh, to better your life, okay? 
And so we went uh, to the German consul, uh, to the American consul, and this and that. And then they stopped the immigration. They stopped it because they had the quarter was full and they couldn't take anymore. So that's it. So then my folks got a nice apartment and bought their furniture. And so they said, that's it. A year later, a letter came and said, if we want to go, we can. So my folks were then already said, no, should we believe everything now what we got? And, you know, so they decided not to go. So coming to America, of course, I was sick as a dog on the transatlantic voyage in an old, old tr troop transporter. It was called uh, General Langford. And we happened to come through during Lent when it was the worst weather in the North Atlantic. We had 100 foot waves. And if the boat wasn't going up and down, which it was a lot of times, it would go up and then down and it would go down so far the back end would lift up out of the water and the propellers would boom, 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 boom like that. Everybody was just sick. So I threw up 10 times in one day. I didn't get dehydrated because luckily I found where they kept the Coke uh, machines. And you could get a Coke but that's why I hate Coke nowadays, because I would drink it and then throw it up. So no Coke products for me at all. And on the voyage over, I think I only had one good meal. They had, when, when it calmed down, they had uh, vegetable soup, which was kind of spicy. And I was only able to get one bowl, and I wanted more, and there wasn't any more. But the boat didn't only go this way, it also went sideways. They had a movie going, and uh, when the boat would go sideways, all the chairs would go wham. And then when it righted itself up, the chairs would go back. Same with the uh, people had suitcases underneath the bunks. The bunks were military where you had two, four, six, in a row like that and uh, whenever the boat leaned all the suitcases would go wham and then back the other way wham put up with that for hours so if you didn't have good good baggage then stuff would just open up and fly all over the place my poor mom and sister they were you know, they separated the women. They were up front. They were up at the bow, and that was the worst because that went up and down the most. We were kind of in the middle, so we had it a little better. And I don't know how much weight I lost, but I know I lost weight. So we got to New York, New York Harbor. When we started out in, in Bremen, the SS United States, that was the flagship of the Atlantic at the time, the fastest ship. It was being loaded, or it, came, it just came in to be loaded, and we were leaving. It actually passed us somewhere in the mid-Atlantic, and it was empty and docked already when we got to New York. So our, our passage was eight, eight days, and the U.S. SS United States made it in six, five or six days, I don't know which. And then uh, when I when I was 18, 19, I met my husband and uh, he was a coal miner in Germany. He was a true German. Uh, he said, how, how would it be if we uh, if uh, we go to America? I said, well, I can ask my aunt. I asked my aunt here. She went to Father Monsignor Wolf at uh, St. Bernard Church. Anybody that came from our people, to need a signature that he has a job and has a place to live, he signed it. So everybody that came, came through St. Bernard, so to speak, through a, through a German uh, Catholic refuge uh, uh, center, whatever you want to call it. And uh, in six months, my husband and I were here. We were not even married yet, and my, my aunt already had made papers that we were married. So bang, bang, we got married over there, and uh, in no time we were here. So this, this is how I wound up here. And my brother that's here, uh, he, the one that's uh, two years 
younger than I am. He came a year before, but he went to California. And then he found out we were here. Then he came and uh, was, uh, stayed with me till he got married. That's how I got here. So, and then we came over here and settled here. We actually had a sponsor in Virginia. And, uh, but that didn't work out because he said he had a working farm and he didn't, he didn't have anything really. And so my aunt and uncle came and got us and brought us to Akron. Coming to America was hard. I was 12, didn't know a word of English, and when they tried to enroll me in school, elementary didn't want me, junior high didn't want me because they didn't want to deal with somebody that didn't speak English. And so uh, they finally, I started in junior high, but they just kept on passing me through, not knowing the language or anything, you know, so it, it was very hard. I wouldn't want to do it again. <laughs> it's no fun being a teenager and not knowing to speak the language and all that, no. <laughs> but it was nice to, to be settled in. Grandma met us at the train station with a friend who had a car. and. Uh, quite a quite a big car and I was I was amazed at the size of it and uh, it was March Ash Wednesday actually is when we arrived and she had turned down the uh, local TV station they were gonna come and interview us and video us and she said no don't need that so we didn't we weren't on TV, which was okay. So we got to the house, her house, and uh, I learned English by watching TV. I had had a half a year English at the German gymnasium, they called it, which was equivalent to our high school. <coughs> but they start earlier there, after fourth. After third grade, you have to take a test. If you don't pass it, you don't get to go to high school. You get to go to trade school or technical school or whatever. So I passed it, and we had English and German the same year, and French. So I learned in six, in six months, I learned quite a bit, and then I watched TV. Grandma kept us home for two weeks. So we would just watch TV and learn language. Then we got to go to Catholic elementary school. It was called St. Joseph's. And the funny thing was they didn't test us or anything. They just stuck us, believe it or not, I couldn't even fit in the chairs, put us in first grade. Me and my brother, one day, my sister was lagging behind. She stayed in first grade. But us, my brother and I, they put us in first, second day and second, third day and third and so on, up the ladder. And then uh, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth grade, got in the math class. That was about the eighth day, I guess. And they were doing math, just the rote math, multiplication, subtraction. and. They asked me to go solve a problem on the board, and I just, I didn't work it out. I just put the answer from my head. And then this one kid was kind of jealous. He says, what kind of math did you do? So I put an algebra problem on the board, and they go, huh? And they asked the nun, is that correct? Is X equal five? And she goes, yeah, that's, that's it. So I, one nun had problems with uh, square roots, so I had to go teach her class how to do square roots. So that was a bit of satisfaction. That's what kind of turned me on the path of being an educator because I enjoyed teaching people math, I guess, or just anything. Still, expectations for America did not always match reality. So we got to the immigration and First thing that really made me 
aware about the prejudice against anyone from Germany. They looked at all our stuff and I was allowed to bring my accordion. And it said Honer, accordion, Honer on the machine and made in Germany and that bastard he ripped off the made in Germany sign. That was the first negative thing I experienced when I got one. Yeah, no, I I was kind of disappointed because in Europe, you know, when I was, well, I was 11 years old and they said, oh, America and America and, oh, you know, it, I thought there was going to be gold or whatever, you know. And we came over here to Alice Island and there was nothing. There was one that, a big old building like, and we were on the ship, we came with the ship. And uh, we came out and we went into that old building and then they told us that we have to go on the train and my dad didn't know and he wanted some food and uh, we, he couldn't fit it because he couldn't speak the, you know, the language at all. But they put us on the train and then they, the train brought us here to Akron because my dad's brother lived here, okay? He was an American years citizen. Before. Yeah, they did. Uh, took us to school up here in you know, Northampton. I was starting the fifth grade in Europe, and uh, I, when I come over, they put me back in the fifth grade again, you know, so that I finished fifth grade again. Yeah. And they were surprised that I was so smart, because in Europe at that time, we did multiplications already, and we did, you know, all kinds of work. And here in the fifth grade, they didn't at that time. So, you know, they were surprised that I knew all that stuff already. As the Donaschwaben settled into their new homes, maintaining their heritage remained very important to them. The German Family Society of Akron began in the basement of St. Bernard's Church in Akron, Ohio. It was one of many German clubs in the area at the time of its foundation, and one of many Dona Schwaben clubs throughout America. Today, it is the only German club remaining in the area. Still, it and the other Dona Schwaben clubs founded throughout the United States and Canada maintain strong bonds. Uh, oh yeah, the German Family Society. Well. There were a lot of people that came over this country around that time, 50 and 51. And uh, through uh, where people worked, my dad worked, and so they would meet sometimes people that uh, also came from Europe. And then a lot of them came through the uh, St. Bernard Church, you know. So they said that the uh, Father Wolf said, okay, you know, that we were allowed to come downstairs in the basement and get together, you know, with the other families. And that's how it started, really. It was started. called St. Saint, Saint Bernard's German Club. The, the sponsorship thing. requirement for many of the immigrants, a signature indicating the prospective immigrant had access to a job and housing in America, resulted in highly concentrated pockets of Dona Schwaben in certain cities. There was there was six German clubs in the Akron area in the South Akron area. I was the German Beck club where I grew up with <clears throat> the GBU Sons of Hermann. There's an Austrian club, and there was probably it's, but the Freiheit. The Freiheit is another one, and they all every one of them went away except for our club. And so it's kind of cool. Even the club that we we used their facility at the German Beck club, they just let us use their facility. It was their it was not our club, but we had to give all our profits to them. Yeah, so. because. Uh, at the German American Club, we had the upstairs, which we rented from the cl club itself because they had a downstairs with the bar and everything. And they really, the kids were not welcome downstairs or anything, even as teenagers or whatever. And but uh, they wanted nothing to do with young people. They, they thought they were nothing but trouble. So they, they were somewhat reluctant to, to let them use the upstairs, but when we realized how many kids we were involved, yeah. that started some irritation between the two the two clubs. Well, after we were there a few years. Yeah, because yeah. They, uh, because there so but many I kids were, we had mm -hmm. huge, huge youth groups and kinder groups back yeah. then. And they, either they were jealous, but they, they didn't have no 
after growth. You know, the younger people, they didn't have any younger people anymore. And they died off. Yeah, they died out. And yeah. They came, yeah. At they one point, it was 80 or a bunch of 80 year olds that were running the place right. as we were parting ways with them. Yeah. And probably another 10 years, it was gone. From there, that's when we went to Burnfield out there. So, yeah, and the Burnfield thing, that was all woods almost in the back. Mm -hmm. And we all, everybody pitched in every day. Somebody came and we cut the trees down. And uh, I mean, they, they, now we have the three uh, soccer fields, you know, in the back up there. So I was, that I was, was lots of I was work. 17 when we moved out there, yeah. so I helped too. So in 1973, they bought the, the property out there in Brimfield. And it was only 10 acres. And then that building, the center part of the building, which you walk in for the, where we eat upstairs on the upper level, up to the bar, that was the whole building. It's been added on five yeah, it times. Was just a little. Uh, it was a machine shop. It was a machine shop at one time. It was, my whole life was the club. I, I, I joined the youth group when I came over when I was about 14, 15. And my kids grew up in the club, and it couldn't have been a better place to bring up your kids. Uh, it's because it's very family oriented and stuff. So uh, the clubs that have young people involved, they're doing good. But there were so many clubs that didn't involve the young people or concentrate on the young people because in order to survive, you got to have your younger generation in there. And which is always what we counted on, you know, having kids in between, youth group, which some of the other clubs didn't do, and so a lot of them have folded. But I think if you concentrate on your younger people, I think you can survive. Today there are Dona Schwaben living in Austria, Germany, the United States, Canada, Australia, and South America. Although they are scattered, many still retain their traditions and connection to one another. Each year, clubs from the United States and Canada gather on Labor Day weekend for the Landestreffen Festival, which is hosted by a different club each year. There, dance groups perform, and the Dona Schwaben from opposite sides of North America have the opportunity to meet one another and create lasting friendships. I love growing up in the youth group. I love the youth group being in there, and I enjoyed having my kids in there and going to the functions every year, Labor Day weekend, meeting all the other people. I think it's a great experience for anybody. Kirvifest is a tradition which reaches back to the beginning of the Dona Schwaben culture. However, it is still important to the Dona Schwaben today, and many clubs still celebrate it. Well, at the club we have uh, Kirchwey, which was a holiday. Uh, the, whenever the church was built, that was that was a date that was observed every year thereafter. It's called Blessing of the Church. That's Kirchwey, that's what that means. So you, it's celebrated every year and we do it at the club. In fact, it's happening this Sunday. They have a mass and a procession around the lake and then they choose two of the most, I don't know what you would call it, A boy and a girl, Kirchway, Kirchway boy and Kirchway girl. The two that have done the, that have been the most exemplary personalities, I guess. Hello. Um, well, I'm not sure if any of you really know what Kirvai is, so welcome to our festival. I'm going to explain to you what the, what our celebration includes. Kirvai is a wonderful tradition of the Danish Fabian culture. The Donishwaben are a German-speaking community who lived in the former Kingdom of Hungary and now cover Hungary, Romania, Croatia, and Serbia. They migrated in large groups from the German areas of Western Europe, taking large boats down the Danube River to Southeastern Europe. Because they started in the city of Ulm in Schwaben and because they sailed on the Danube River, they became known as Donishwabians, or Donishwabens. Or if you're just one of us, we call each other Schwabs. The word Kirvai is derived from the words Kirsha, meaning church, and Vayan, meaning to bless. To honor and thank God, the Danishwabans built a church in each town and celebrated its blessing each year. These celebrations were known as Kirvai. 
Eventually, the Kirvai became the most important annual festival in every village. Today, we celebrate Kirvai in remembrance of our ancestors, their trials, and traveling down the Danube, and eventually settling in America. We remember their efforts in, in making a better life for themselves and their families. Most importantly, we celebrate the blessings in our lives today because of their courage and sacrifices. Rosemary and the Life of the Donaschwaben. A small bouquet of rosemary is a symbol of love, faith, and earth. For the Donaschwaben, it is our constant companion throughout the year, throughout our whole life, from the joyous celebration of baptism to the hour of leave-taking from the deceased. The little sprig of rosemary, as a symbolic mark, epitomizes fertility, health, and the life-creating power on special occasions such as christening, wedding, and burial. It is used for the Donaschwaben today during Kirvai celebrations and Swabian balls. Once again, we will now celebrate our own Kirvai. The Blue Candle Ceremony is a much more recent tradition than Kirvai, but no less important. The purpose for the blue candle, uh, some of us that came and lost our homeland, and uh, uh, the board of the, you know, the Landes Verband board got together and said it would be a beautiful thing to, uh, to have a blue candle for all the clubs in the United States and light that candle. Uh, and whenever they have their Christmas uh, uh, part, uh, 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 festival, okay? And this is uniting us all, the ones that lost our homeland. That is the purpose of the Blue Candle. Thank you. The Blue Candle Ceremony is another way for all the Dona Schwaben clubs in the United States to remember those they left behind and remain connected to their heritage and to each other. Another way they maintain this heritage is through dance. Many clubs have dance groups for all ages, from Kindergruppe to Jugendgruppe to the adult Tanzgruppe. These groups continue to perform dances in the style of those danced by their ancestors in Europe. Well, you know, we didn't get in Europe, we didn't get together in Yugoslavia like we do here. I mean, we did have uh, uh, dances, but it wasn't, how shall I say that? They did have once in, once in a while a get together or something. They had the the news guy that came in in the in the street and he would say the news and and uh, it wasn't the, the, the court. I mean, if you go back now yeah. and you see how they where we have groups coming from Hungary as an example, it's the, the dances specific. The dances then they're none of them are really the same, but the whole concept of how we dance is is the same. You know, the, the, the way that they split off and do this and they're marching around and stuff like that. that that's still all, they, 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 we are a lot more, we do, we have more, comp, um, we, we more, we're a lot more in our dances than what they do. If you ever have still, in contrast with some more traditional clubs, many clubs have choreographed more fast-paced and exciting dances to perform, while still following the style of the original Dina Schwab. But the, 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 the yeah. theme's still there. The reason I I don't know because uh, we uh, our Donia uh, Schwab uh, when we started uh, to to get the culture going and uh, to do everything the way uh, culture uh, life uh, we didn't have we didn't have the money to pay somebody to put that on a big bell so to speak uh, there were millions and millions of our Donia Schwab that are dead because of the war. And we have people, when we left our homeland, we got scattered all over the world. We have them in Brazil, we have them in Australia, we have them in Argentina, we have them every continent on this earth, you will find Donauschwaben. And they're very hardworking people. Yet the scars of the past continue to weigh on the minds of survivors. Well, uh, I, uh, uh, 
the, the biggest regret is that I, I missed a lot of schooling. My schooling is uh, I educated myself. I'm a self-educator, if you want to say that that way. Whatever I know, I taught myself. And that is my biggest, biggest cry, issue about the whole situation. That I did not have a childhood, I didn't have a youth. Uh, we came to, uh, to, to Germany, I was 14. I started to go to work because we were five people in the house and we needed, everybody needed to work. And that was, that was it. My grandparents didn't like talking about it that much. So yeah, it's one of those things. It's not the fact of growing up, it's the fact of the war. Whatever happened during or before, you know? My grandfather passed away two years ago. He was the only one who spoke of it, and just briefly. So yeah, I don't know much. Well, whenever I get a chance, I talk about it. But it's it's hard to reflect on the because it was all bad all bad stuff and your mind tries to erase the bad things. I know I saw hundreds of bodies and but it's blotted out of my mind. I just remember eating when Grandma came in and stole stuff and she brought it back to camp. There's still a lot of strange attitudes out there left over from, you know, World War II, I guess. And you're still going to run up against things like that no matter how much time passes by, media influences being what they are. There's still a lot of that going on. I mean, it, with time, it, it, it's all going to die off. I mean, the, 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 yeah. the, the Dona Schwab, like I said, she's one of the younger ones and she's in her 80s. It's, it's kind of important to us that, it, that it's remembered, but it is going to fade in time. What, what concern, you know, I guess sometimes they always say, never forget that you don't want to have, have that ever yeah. happen again. Yet, through the haze of a painful past, the future shines bright for the Dona Schwaben and their strong cultural identity. The remaining youth programs are robust and passionate as each new generation of Dona Schwaben celebrates and maintains the tradition of their heritage. It's, like I say, it's it uh, up and down the years, the years went up and down. It was it was a very struggle for those people. And then they built cities, they built churches, they built beautiful countries, uh, uh, homes, uh, towns, picture perfect. And uh, uh, and then they had to leave there again. They had to, they had to leave there. In, uh, where they started out immigrating to Yugoslavia, and then they had to leave that, what they had there, and then they settled in, in Austria or Germany. They left that and came over here. So it was up and down the years, that's what, that, what I meant to say.